guys, so this is going to be my labor and delivery explanation video, kind of talking about everything that happened that day and like the day before and what I went through and kind of just getting like a more elaborate explanation behind everything that happened because if you watch my birth video then you know it was kind of insane and there was not a lot of time to like explain things throughout vlogging so that's what this video is for just like a more in-depth video talking about my whole labor and delivery so First things first, if you have not seen my labor and delivery video, you can click right here. That will take you right there. Go watch that first, or I'll have a link down in the description below. You should definitely watch that if you want to know more about how my labor and delivery went, because this is just going to kind of go along with everything you saw in that video. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. It is a long story. I was due November 13th, Sunday, November 13th, and on Saturday, November 12th, I was obviously extremely pregnant. I was almost due. I was doing everything my power to get that child out of me. We went up to like this recreational park where I was running up and down stairs, I was curb walking, I was doing all kinds, like everything in the book, like you name it, I was doing it there. So that day, or that evening, I guess I should say, around 4 p.m., I started getting pretty consistent contractions. At that time, they were like seven minutes apart or so, and they lasted the rest of the evening. They were only like just barely noticeable. They weren't exactly like painful, but they were consistent. They were consistently seven minutes apart pretty much all evening long, and then I finally just went to bed. I was like, nothing's happening. Um, and then during that night, so this was Saturday night, I kept having contractions, and I was able to fall asleep, but around 3 a.m. I woke up, and I was, they were painful. Like, it was painful enough to wake me up, Obviously not painful enough to think like I'm gonna push this thing out right now, but it was something. It was something, it wasn't just Braxton Hicks contractions. I just tried to fall back asleep. I tried to get as much rest as I can, knowing that sometime in the next two weeks I was gonna have a baby. So I was just trying to be patient, you know? I went back to sleep and I woke up the next morning. Around seven o'clock in the morning I got up and just like, did my regular morning routine, got the kids up, got the kids dressed. This was a Sunday, so we had planned to go out to eat breakfast with my best friend Janelle and my husband and all of our kids. Consistently, all morning long, my contractions were about 10 minutes apart. Again, it's, it was nothing like crazy. They were just noticeable. Like I could tell that I was having contractions. I was trying to keep myself busy, trying not to think about it too much, because once you start thinking, then you get excited and then your body slows down and stops your labor. At breakfast, they went from being 10 minutes apart to about seven minutes apart pretty consistently and they were starting to pick up too it was starting to get to a point where I was like not super super happy-go-lucky but like kind of irritated you know it was kind of a loud environment obviously we're out at breakfast I was just kind of irritable after breakfast we decided to go to the park and take the kids out I wanted to get out of the house I wanted to like keep moving and stay active and like get on my feet and get labor rolling get stuff going on Chris took the kids to the park and was playing with them at the park and me and my best friend just walked around the park for a good one to two hours. I was still having contractions. I was mostly having a lot of like cervix pain, like, or pressure, I guess I should say, that lightning crotch feeling that people always talk about. I was just like waiting for my water to break, you know, like something, give me a sign. But of course, nothing really happened. Um, my contractions were at this point, I was not timing them anymore, so I'm not sure exactly how far apart they were, but we loaded up the kids, and since I was still having contractions and they had been consistent more than they had any other day in like the past week, I decided to call my grandma who was gonna be on call for picking up the boys when I went into labor I didn't tell her I was like in labor or anything but I just kind of explained to her what was going on I said it was a possibility that I might call her in a little while and ask her to take the boys that I would just basically keep her posted I was just kind of like letting her know on top of that I called my mom which I call like every 10 minutes anyway so it wasn't that big of a deal but I told her what was going on I told her that I was having a lot more contractions than I did like on any regular day and so she decided to go ahead and put sub plans in because she is a teacher so she decided to put to get sub plans ready and get a sub for the following day which was Monday just in case anything had happened but anyway she decided that she was going to take the next the following day off in hopes that I was gonna go into labor and I texted my birth photographer because she does have kids she has a life outside of just being a photographer she told me to let her know like ahead of time as give her as much time as possible if I can if I start having contractions just to kind of give her a heads up to like let her know that she may or may not be joining us later that evening so I texted her and told her that I had been having contractions and that there's a possibility that I might call her at 2 a.m. which was really funny because I did call her at almost exactly 2 a.m. so we went home after we went to the park and we just had quiet time
time. We put the kids in their beds, let them just rest. They were playing really hard at the park, so they were tired. I was tired from walking around so much, and I just sat on my birthing ball, and we just kind of rested. We watched TV. Everybody in the whole house just rested. And at that point, I started timing my contractions again, and they were about 11 minutes apart, which is a little bit, like of a bummer to me at first because I was like, oh, I've been like walking so much. Why are they not closer together? But I was noticing that they were getting more intense. So over a period of like, I don't know, maybe two hours or so, we just kind of rested and my contractions slowly started getting closer and closer together. So when I sat down, they were like 11 minutes apart and then they went to 10 minutes apart, nine minutes apart. And I think they stayed at about nine minutes apart for another few hours and they might have gotten close. Either way, all day I had been having contractions all day, anywhere between seven minutes and 11 minutes apart. So I had a feeling that there was like, something was happening, but I didn't know how long this was gonna last because with Lily, I had contractions for three days. With the twins, I had contractions for three weeks. With Landon, I had him that day. I started having contractions in the morning and then I had him that night. So who knows? My labors are just so insanely different. I didn't exactly know if I was gonna have a baby that night or if I was, if it would be a couple days, but I could tell something was happening. Like my body was getting ready. After we rested a little bit, I wanted to start like get going again. So I decided let's go to the mall. It's get, it was getting dark outside. So we took all of the kids to my best friend Janelle's house where her mom was and she watched all the kids for us and like let them play and let them like have fun so they weren't stuck walking around the mall for another two hours so me Chris and my best friend Janelle went to the mall where you could see me in the video I was like running up and down these stairs and they had like escalators there but one of the escalators was broken so I just like used that to my advantage and kept running up and then going back down and then running up and going back down and then we came across these people who were giving massages and they're like those annoying pushy people that you always find in the mall and they're like I'm gonna give you a massage and you're like, no, I really don't want a massage. But I was like, you know what? Why not? I think I'm gonna get a massage. And I told him, here's the thing. I'm due today. I want this baby out. I don't care what you gotta do. Push all those little pressure point push like places. Do what you gotta do. Try to get this baby out for me. So he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. So it was more so like a joke, but I figured why not? Like it's not gonna hurt at this point. So I sat down and I got like a 15 or 20 minute massage from those people where he was trying to push all these like pressure points and stuff. So that was just kind of funny. But the funny thing about that day, and I did mention this a little bit in that vlog but this was the day of the super moon so that night the super moon was supposed to come out which is where like the moon is significantly closer to the earth than it is normally so a lot of people had already told me this and they were like maybe you'll have your baby on the day of the super moon so that was really cool and actually Chris's grandma since obviously she was born that day Chris's grandma calls her moonbeam because she was born the day that the moon was closest to the earth so anyway, we had arrived at the mall around 5 p.m. and we stayed there until it closed and since it was a Sunday it closed at 7 so while the kids were still out there friend's house we came home for a little bit and just kind of we kind of wanted to like regroup like decide what we were gonna do am I gonna call someone am I not gonna call someone I decided let's just sit down for like 30 minutes and see how far apart they are see how intense they are and decide do I want to just go to sleep or are they more intense to where I think this might actually be happening and maybe I should call someone so we sat around for about 30 minutes or so and just kind of trying to get a feel for everything and my contractions were still very consistent they were starting to pick up pain wise so I decided you know what like I might not have a baby tonight but at this point I think I'm gonna go ahead and call my grandma the kids Gigi since she was gonna watch them like when I was having the baby and I'm just gonna tell her go ahead let's go ahead and just pick them up I wasn't hundred percent sure that something was going to happen but my instincts were kind of just telling me just let them go that way I can like focus on my body and <laughs> this baby if in the end nothing happens that at least I got some rest you know without the kids so I went ahead and called Gigi and I told her let's go ahead and do this come on over I'll pack their stuff and we're gonna send them off with you guys so we went back to my best friend's house where all the kids were I had all the kids bags packed Gigi came it was about 8 30 by the time she got there and they were all so ready for bed anyway so it actually kind of like really worked out because all she had to do was take them home and like put them to sleep and then not really have to worry about it you know so at that point I was trying to decide do I want Lilia to come back to my house or do I want to leave her here and I did explain this a little bit in the video too I didn't send her with Gigi because Gigi lives further out from where we live I figured she was either going to attend the birth or go to school the next day I didn't want my grandma to have to wake up everybody super early to drag her across town to go to school so anyway we just figured out that it was easier that she either come home with me and watch the baby be born because I did talk about that possibility or have her stay at my best friend's house and um, stay the night there and go to school the next day so I talked to her a little bit at that time she was kind of just playing I told her that I might have a baby tonight and I kind of explained things to her and at that time she didn't seem super excited to 
come watch the birth and if she doesn't want to watch the birth I'm not gonna make her watch the birth so she had told me previously that she was interested in being there and that she wanted to be there when the baby was born but considering it was already 8 30 at night she's I'm not gonna keep her up all night you know to labor or whatever and she was happy where she was at we decided let's just leave her we're not gonna push it the timing just isn't right it's late at night she's tired she has school in the morning if nothing happens she at least needs to go to school so that's why we ended up leaving her there so at that point I came back home I just kind of rested sat on my birthing ball it was still me Chris and my best friend and we were just kind of hanging out talking you know and I started timing my contractions again and they were about five to six minutes apart pretty consistently and they were definitely getting more painful so I called my mom and I updated her told her what was happening I told her she's more than welcome to come over and hang out with us and see if anything happens or she can stay there and try to sleep and I'll call her if something does happen but around 10 30 she decided that she wanted to come over it's weird how just like things work out right like your body's just know your instincts just know so she just decided even though she is like like so keen on her sleep she thought that it would be a good idea to go ahead and come over so that should have been a sign to me that her like her motherly instincts were kicking in you know about 10 30 p.m. she came over my contractions were still about five to six minutes apart and increasingly getting more painful so at that point we just kind of waited it was just kind of like talking hanging out I was still obviously very happy in between contractions um, during the contractions they hurt and I was getting to that point where like if you've watched me in my previous labors I in the past have been very much like don't touch me don't look at me don't talk don't breathe when I'm having a contraction so I was starting to get to like that point in my labor where it was like don't talk like it's just like distracting you know however a lot of people pointed out that this labor and delivery I had Chris touching me a lot and in the past I wanted nobody to touch at me I wanted nobody to look at me and for some reason I just needed his touch like him touching me really distracted me from the pain that I was in and I felt like it helped so so much so I was so happy to have him there I think it was just it's a very different atmosphere than my previous births were if you know what I mean so um, having him there and having him touch me and having him like rub me was so comforting to me and it's definitely something that I needed at that point but still the talking like during contractions I was just like let's just be quiet so around the time that my mom came over like right before and right after we started rearranging my room to make the tub fit in our room because basically we have like a king size bed and we have a couple different dressers in here and a crib and we had to rearrange the room in order to make the crib fit where it needed to fit and in order for the midwives to like get around the tub we just had to move things around so after we moved everything around I just continued to sit on my birthing ball and time contractions and at this point contractions were lasting over a minute long and they started getting kind of irregular at first they were consistently five minutes apart and they started being really weird like I don't remember ever feeling this with any of my other labors but I would have like a pretty intense contraction and then like two minutes later I'd have like a mini contraction and then two minutes later again I'd have like a big long contraction so it was really weird and the contractions were lasting like over a minute long each so in between I was not having a lot of time at all to kind of like recoup so that's when we decided it's probably time to go ahead and call my midwife just after one 1 a.m. We called the midwife and we told her what was going on. She said she's coming immediately. She's coming right over. And then right after we got off the phone with her, that's when you can see the part where I was sitting in the living room and I had just had a contraction and the contraction had just ended and I felt like a gush and it was really weird it wasn't like a huge gush it wasn't like I had just like peed myself but it was enough like I don't know if this is TMI but like you know if you're on your period or something and you could just feel when something's coming out you know so it was totally TMI but it felt like that I could just feel something come out up to this point I had not lost a single dot of mucus plug my water was still intact no bloody show I'd had nothing up to this point so when I felt that I was like something's happening so I reached down to kind of like check it out and see what it was to see if it was my water or what it was when I looked it was blood it was what I thought was kind of a lot of blood so immediately I went to the bathroom and I kind of checked myself at first it was pretty runny like it was kind of like um just plain blood you know it wasn't that mucusy at first but then when I like wiped a little bit more and kind of weighed a little bit more it was just very mucusy bloody show and it was a lot of mucusy mucusy bloody show and I had had this with Landon too I guess I just forgot how like much 
bloody mucus you can have, you know, but I just don't remember it being this like sudden before. So minutes later, the midwife arrived. We sh told her what happened and I showed her, obviously she was like monitoring, um, like when I wiped how much was coming out and she was like, I'm going to go ahead and check you just to make sure. So she went ahead and decided to check me, which my midwife does not usually do. She doesn't usually check you during labor unless you request it or something's going on. So since I just randomly started bleeding, she decided to go ahead and check me and I was at four centimeters dilated. I feel like when she checked me, that's when things like really started to pick up. I was four centimeters dilated. It was just after 1.30. Chris started to set up the birth tub. He blew it up and we started filling it. And that's when you can see in the video, she checks my blood pressure. She checks my pulse. She took my temperature. She kind of like made sure that everything was okay. And then she started monitoring the baby's heart rate. So it was every, it was like pretty much every contraction that they would check the baby's heart rate, either during or after they would check the baby's heart rate, every single contraction, even when I was in the water. I know a lot of people who are not very familiar with home birth, they don't realize that the baby is still monitored constantly. It's just, you don't have to wear this annoying like wrap thing that goes around you to do it, that they just do it manually. About two o'clock, I went ahead and hopped into the birth tub and my contractions were definitely, definitely picking up. It seemed like everything just started happening like really, really fast. And so at 2 a.m., I finally got into the birth tub and then that's when we just waited. It was like, a lot of the day was spent waiting and then like things started picking up really, 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 really fast. And then it was a lot of waiting again. At this point, I was no longer timing contractions. I'm sure my midwife was, I wasn't. I don't know if any of my friends were, but I was not timing contractions anymore. And it almost seems like, compared to my last home birth, when I got into the pool this time, my, my labor actually started to slow down just a little bit. I feel like I had longer breaks in between contractions, but one thing is for sure, the second I got into that birthing tub, my contractions, were so much less painful. I know that that's like a reason why people want to have water births is because of that, but I don't remember it being so dramatic last time. Like I, I was in so much pain when I was outside of the tub and when I had gotten inside of the tub, it was just like night and day so much better. It was like immediate pain relief. I think I forgot to say this too, but at 1.30 when my midwife got there, she told me to go ahead and call my birth photographer, let her know that things were happening. So we called her and she started to head over. And then my main midwife also has two other midwives that were attending the birth as well. So everybody was contacted that at that point to go ahead and head on over. This was the real deal. We're having a baby. So between 2 a.m. and then like when I had her pretty much, um, it was just like I said a lot of waiting and I got up a few different times to go pee And I just noticed that every time I got up to go pee my contractions hit me like head-on They were excruciating almost unbearable when I got out of the tub um, To the point where I would like walk two steps and have a contraction and then walk two steps and have another contraction And walk two steps and have another contraction and then when I'd sit down on the toilet I sat there for like 10-15 minutes before I got the courage to get back up and get back into the pool and and when I got back into that pool, man, did it feel good. I just gotta say, having a water birth is definitely something that everyone should look into. It was so amazing. It was such a difference from being outside of it and getting back in it. The pain relief was just very, very good. I remember just being really, really hot inside of the birth tub because the birth tub does have to stay at a very specific temperature. They want it at 99 degrees, but there was a couple different times where it was warmer than 99 degrees because you had to like keep it balanced. You know, we had to add warm water and then it would cool down and then add warm water again and then cool down. And I just remember being so hot and sweaty and between Chris and my amazing midwives, they kept bringing me like cold cloths to kind of put around my neck to cool me off a little bit. But I was exhausted at this point. I was like super tired. I was super hot. I was in a lot of pain and it seems like when I got to the point where I couldn't handle it any longer That's when things like started happening at about 4 30. That's when I think transition really hit That's when things just like went from being like fine and dandy to very 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 intense I could physically feel the baby getting lower and lower and lower going into my birth canal It's like such a crazy surreal experience to be able to actually feel your body do that. Between 4.30 and 5, it was still just lots of intense contractions. Then about 5 o'clock, that's when like the exhaustion really hit me. I remember I started dozing off in between contractions. I was like leaning on the birth tub like this. And then in between contractions, I would... <laughs> Sorry, little lady woke up. Look how big she's getting. I weighed her last night or two nights ago and she was already 9 pounds, 10 ounces. You wanna say hi? She's like, no, put me back to sleep. Oh, feed me and put me back to sleep, huh? Anyway, so where was I? Um, So around 5 a.m., 
I remember just being so exhausted that I started dozing off like in between contractions and I was laying on the birth pool. I was laying on the pool like this and in between contractions I would like start to kind of fall asleep a little bit. And at that point too I remember I was grabbing Chris's hand or like his arm or something and every time I would have a contraction like this is like so stereotypical like you know when the mom is in labor and she squeezes the dad's hand I was squeezing the crap out of his hand and I feel really bad like I feel like I could have like fractured his hand with how hard I was squeezing it but it really helped me kind of take the focus like off of the pain that I was in and like focus on something else just like squeezing the crap out of him I feel really bad so about 5 20 a.m. I started pushing everybody's different and like every labor is different and every delivery is different but for me in the past like pushing has always been the I don't want to say easy because it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination but it's definitely like easier than the labor is like I would pick pushing over laboring any day that's just my opinion oh she just pooped on me all right we're gonna see how many outfit changes we're gonna do in one video she literally just pooped all over everything so we're back and we're gonna finish our story huh we gonna finish our story <laughs> between like having contractions or pushing the baby out like I'd rather push the baby out but this time around this for some reason pushing her out was harder than pushing out any of my other kids like with the twins Kyson pretty much just like came out first push and then Landon he came out pretty much one push and then with Lilia I had an epidural so I couldn't really feel anything I started pushing at 520 and she was born at 527 so it was like almost 10 minutes of pushing that I had with her and it was only about four contractions so for a lot of people that might sound like it's not a lot but I don't know how these women can push for like hours on end. I know like on average women push for about two hours before the baby's born. Major props to you guys who push for that long because holy crap, I this is the longest I've ever had to push and it was only like four contractions and this was the hardest time I have ever had trying to push out a baby and she was not even that big. Like Landon was bigger than she was. Plus Landon was born like this with his arm right here. So like I don't know what it was but she was just, I feel like it was so much harder to push her out than any of my other kids. So anyway, I started pushing at 520 and about four contractions later four pushes later she was born 527 a.m. this was the moment that we had been waiting for for the past nine months ten months depending on how you look at it it was just so amazing so surreal so relieving <laughs> to finally have her out what's funny is that she was born at 527 in the morning and Chris really likes that because his birthday is May 27th so 527 so he found that like so super cool so when she was born we had already pre-discussed like who was gonna say if it was a boy or a girl we already pre-decided that we wanted Chris to be able to say if it was a boy or if it was a girl so you can see that moment where when she was born I brought her up and it took us a minute to kind of or a second to like lift her up and then her legs were closed a certain way so we had like turn her a certain way to look and then when we lifted her up and I think we were both so shocked like I looked and I realized that it was a girl and then I showed Chris because we had already decided that we were he was gonna announce if, whether it was a boy or a girl and he was like so shocked like he couldn't even he was just like speechless that's when you hear me say in the video I'm like tell him because he's just like so I think stunned that it's actually a girl that it took him a second to kind of get it out so at that moment you hear him say it's a girl and then everybody screams and they're all happy it was the absolute like perfect labor and delivery like it really couldn't have gone any better it was so smooth textbook everything went great and it wasn't until after that moment that she was born and everything was just absolutely perfect that things kind of turned for the worst so this is where things for me kind of get a little like blurry I guess I was just so in love so in awe you get this like natural high after your baby's born like you just can't believe that that actually happened and frankly I had just pushed a baby out of my vagina so, so everything after this point was just kind of a blur it was just kind of I don't remember all the exact details of everything so I'm gonna try to remember everything as they happened and like based off of what was explained to me like during and afterwards I'm gonna try to like put it all together so hopefully it makes the most sense for you guys and you have to realize that in my labor and delivery footage in just the afterbirth alone after she was born there was like 30 minutes of non-stop footage that I went through and had to edit and put into something that lasted like two minutes long so a lot of people were 
kind of making judgments about how things should have gone and how things did go and I just have to say that this is just like a disclaimer before I explain everything that happened but there was so much that went on in all that time I just summed it up into like a tiny tiny little fragment of it was literally like a couple minutes that I put all this footage into so you have to kind of keep that in mind so anyway she was born Everything was perfect. Perfect delivery, perfect successful birth. She was perfect, I was fine up to that point, and nothing had gone wrong. So after she was born, it had been about five minutes, maybe less, it's hard to really tell, when we started talking about the delivery of the placenta. So at first, the midwife was like, how are you feeling? Do you feel like you need to push yet? I mean, I've had several children before this. I know what it feels like when you need to push a placenta out. And I kind of know, like, how things go. At first, we just kind of waited. A lot of people don't know this. Even if they've had babies, some people don't realize this. But after a baby's born, you're not done. <laughs> your body still has contractions to get the placenta out. The placenta is an organ that grows in your body to keep the baby alive when they're inside of you. It gives them the nutrition that they need. It gives them everything that they need to survive inside of the womb so after the baby's born you have to deliver that placenta you think you're done pushing things out once the baby's out that's not the case the placenta the dang placenta can cause a lot of issues most of the time it doesn't but if something does happen it can be fatal for the mom on average it takes about 5 to 20 minutes for the placenta to be born for you to birth the placenta anything after like 20 to 30 minutes is when you start to get concerned the reason why the placenta needs to be delivered within this short amount of time is because if you do not deliver the placenta it puts you at risk for infection and it increases the risk for excessive blood loss for the mother which can be fatal it can kill you if the placenta stays inside of you for too long and it causes the mother to bleed so this is kind of sorry, little see little baby feetsies the placenta is kind of a big deal there's a lot of people who are like who cares it's just the placenta the placenta is a very big deal my midwives told me to stand up out of the pool and make my way over to the bed where we were gonna try to deliver the placenta because at this point it still hadn't been delivered it was only about five minutes it's after the baby's born at this point. We weren't concerned, but when I stood up, the midwives noticed that I was bleeding just a little bit more than normal. It wasn't anything like life-threatening. It was just something that was a little bit more than usual. And a lot of people also don't realize that midwives carry pretty much everything that they need. They have Pitocin, they have like different kinds of drugs that they need on hand for situations like mine that happen. So at that point, to my understanding, is when they administered the first dose of Pitocin into my right leg. That was to just control the bleeding. It's very common just to kind of control the bleeding while we figured out what, what was kind of going on. So we're sitting and waiting. Um, that's pretty much all you do. We're all ooing and aahing over her. She starts nursing. She latches perfectly. So it was about 12 minutes after she was born. They started massaging like my uterus, my stomach area, and they started um, just doing like little things to kind of encourage the placenta to like get the heck out. That's when I could tell like, even though I'm not an expert and I'm not I'm not a doctor, I'm not a midwife, I'm nothing like that. I've had a lot of children and I kind of I could kind of tell that things were not going probably as they should have been. Like I don't remember the placenta ever taking this long with my other babies to be born. <laughs> so you can see them in the video and you hear them talk about it a little bit, but like I said, there's so much footage that just didn't make it into the video or that you couldn't hear them saying. Um, but they administered the second dose of Pitocin um, into my left leg. They were explaining this whole process to me as it was happening but like I said I was just in such a daze I don't remember exactly what was said I just remember them being very very um supportive and they were like talking me through it and telling me it's okay and I think like the fact that they were like telling me it's okay made me kind of think like what am I not okay <laughs> like why wait a minute why are you guys telling me that more time had passed the midwives decided that it was best for me to stand up and try to deliver the placenta that way kind of let gravity like take its course when I stood up I think you can hear in the video actually if you turn it up pretty loud you can hear when I stand up um you just hear like water dripping and that's blood coming out of me so that's when they really started to get concerned the bleeding was more or less under control and um it wasn't so much about bleeding as much as it was we need to like get this placenta out because if it doesn't come out then that's when it becomes a problem they definitely made me feel like I was okay but at the same time they wanted to know that this wasn't exactly normal either so if after 30 minutes your placenta still has not delivered itself they tend to call it a retained placenta a 
retained placentas occur in about 3% of vaginal deliveries, so it's not very common, and it happens whether you're at a hospital, it happens whether you're at home. I think this might have freaked a lot of people out, like in terms like of the whole home birth aspect, but this had nothing to do with where I delivered. This would have happened if I was at the hospital, and this would have happened if I was at home. So I do just want to make that clear. This happens to people everywhere, and it, there's nothing you can really do to prevent it, and there's nothing that they could have done to see it coming either. It just happens sometimes, and it's unfortunate. There's different kinds of retained placentas. At this point, nobody knew what kind mine was. It could be something minor, it could be something like more major. Nobody knows at this point. Whether you're at a hospital or at home, nobody knows what's wrong with your placenta until they go in there and they figure it out. So you can hear this a little bit in the video, but like I said, a lot of this part was cut out. Basically, I stood up, the placenta still did not detach. At that point, they had realized that my placenta was not still attached to my uterus. It was partially detached from my uterus, which is actually worse than it being like still attached to your uterus because your body is trying to bleed it out and get it out of your body, but something inside of your body, and it could be several different things, was making it not happen. And at the time, nobody knew exactly what that was. Nobody knew exactly why my placenta was not being delivered. Once I stood up and we realized that the placenta was not coming out, that's when you hear her say, I've got to go in, or something along those lines. So I knew what she was saying at that point. I had, there was three different midwives there. The two of them were like tending to what, what I was needing medically, and one of them was by my ear the whole time, and you cannot see her, but she is the one who was like explaining everything to me and she was there by my side. She was kind of like walking me through everything and telling me how I'm gonna be okay. That's the thing that a lot of people don't see because obviously the only camera that captured any of these moments was the one that we had set up on the tripod. So you can only hear what's right around that camera and you can't see anything else that's going on anywhere else. So when she said, I've gotta go in, I have a flashback to when I had the twins. I had been through this before and it wasn't for the placenta, it was for the baby, it was for Caden. So I knew exactly what she was saying. I had the other midwife kind of telling me what was gonna happen. I knew that there was nothing that I could do to like change the situation, that this had to be done, but I was scared obviously nonetheless. So I cut a lot of this part out because it was extremely painful, a lot of me screaming, I didn't want to traumatize anybody. The midwife had to perform what was called a manual extraction of the placenta in order to attempt to get the placenta out of me because like I said, if it stays inside of you, for too long that's when it becomes an issue and I cannot remember at ex what exact moment we called 911 but I feel like it was at this point that um, we had decided that we needed to call an ambulance and we're going we were most likely going to transfer okay I had to give her back to daddy she was getting antsy what was I saying so basically the, the midwife had to go in for what's called a manual extraction and this is something that they perform in the hospital and they perform at home. This is a routine procedure that's done when you have a retained placenta. It's just something that they have to do to try to get the placenta out. So what happened was the first midwife went in elbow deep all the way up into my uterus to hopefully detach the rest of the placenta and to get out that way. When she went in the first time, she discovered that I had what is called a bicornate uterus, which is basically um, a weird shaped uterus. Most people's uterus is kind of like a pear shape. Some people have what's more of like a heart shaped uterus, and my uterus is shaped in a way such that I have a tiny portion of my uterus that is misshaped. So like, it's basically like a tiny bubble at the top of my uterus. So the rest of my uterus is pretty normal and I have a small, almost like a bubble, like a tiny section of my uterus that is just kind of awkwardly shaped. When you get pregnant, your placenta can detach anywhere in the uterus. It's just completely random to where the placenta decides to attach to the uterus. And what happened with her is that when I got pregnant with her, her placenta happened to attach to the exact spot where that little bubble in my uterus was. So this is not something that can generally be seen on an ultrasound. This is not something that anybody can have any sort of knowledge about until it actually happens. This could have happened with any of my pregnancies. It is just by complete chance that my placenta happened to attach to this particular spot in my uterus that happened to cause this problem. When they went in, they had discovered that I had an adherent placenta that was trapped in this horn of my bicornate uterus. And that's like a lot of big words. This is like my understanding of it. So when they went in for manual extraction of this placenta, that's when they discovered that it, my placenta was actually detaching. It was doing exactly what it was supposed to be doing. Um, it was detaching from the uterus, but it was literally stuck in this tiny portion of my uterus and my uterus was contracting to try to get it out. So when you're having a baby or you're trying to deliver the placenta, your uterus will contract. Each time it contracts, it contracts and it contracts. So I had this little like horn of my uterus here. My uterus was contracting to get this placenta out and when it was contracting, it was actually making my placenta stuck. 
The only way at that point to get my placenta out was being transferred for a DNC, which is a medical procedure where they go inside and they have to surgically remove your placenta. And I just want to say I'm so, so, so grateful that I had such amazing midwives that knew when to make the call, what they needed to do before that point, what they needed to do after that point, and what they were not capable of doing. When you decide to have a baby, whether you have it at a hospital or, or at home, whether you hire an OBGYN or a midwife, you have to put your trust into that person's hands. And you have to trust them that they're going to make the right decisions for your baby and your body when you don't have the knowledge to do that. And I just have to say that they went beyond my expectations of anything I could have possibly imagined to keep me safe and keep my baby safe. There's something that my midwife told me that was like during all this that was happening, because like I said, everything was such a blur. There was so much going on. There were so many people talking. But there was one thing that my midwife told me that I will never forget and that just kind of like took away from any anything else that was going on at the moment. She leaned over and she told me, I just want to let you know that you are perfectly okay right now. Everything is fine. At this point right now, you are not in danger, but we need to get you to a hospital before you are in danger. So like, it's not like I was bleeding to death and they were like, call 911, she's gonna die. It wasn't like that at all. Every single call that the midwife made was made at the right time to where I was never, throughout this whole process, I was never in danger. If if they had waited, I would have been in danger. I could have died if they didn't call and have me transferred to a hospital. But the fact is that they knew exactly what they needed to do, what they were capable of doing, and when it was time to make the call for surgical removal of the placenta. Basically, moving on, the ambulance came, they rode me to the hospital in the ambulance, and they transferred me to L&D, where I waited for an OBGYN to come and check out what was going on, and ultimately, they were gonna do a DNC. I had to sign the paper to get ready to have surgery basically and so what ended up happening is actually somewhat of like a miracle I think I don't know it's just very crazy but by the time I was transferred to the hospital my bleeding was very minimal it was it was almost nothing it was nothing that we needed to be concerned about at all because my amazing midwives had put that under control that since they had successfully stopped my bleeding and I was successfully transferred to a hospital by the time the OBGYN got there to deliver the placenta my uterus had actually relaxed enough for that OBGYN to go in there and retrieve the placenta manually without going into surgery. I just can't help but think that if I had been at a hospital and the same exact thing happened, my uterus would have been so clamped shut that they, it would have been inevitable that I would have been sent to surgery and that just would have been it. They would have been the same thing. They would have tried to retrieve the placenta manually. They would have been unsuccessful because of the way that my placenta was contracted and I would have then been sent straight to have a DNC. Whereas since I delivered at home, that allowed my body to have enough time for my whole uterus to actually relax and for the placenta to actually come out um, somewhat, some version of it on its own, at least not surgically. They still had to manually extract the placenta, but I did not have to get the DNC after all of that. I just think that that is an absolute miracle that after all that I went through, I still was not sent to surgery. So once the placenta was outside of my body, that's when everybody was able to finally just relax. <laughs> so once all this was done, the doctor who, ha who had gotten my placenta out came up to me and this was probably the worst experience I've ever had with a doctor and I've had a lot of pretty bad experiences with the doctor. After just going through everything that I had just gone through, she came up to me and said, I just want to let you know that if you ever plan on having any more babies, this is why we discourage home births. Basically shaming me for choosing to have a home birth and kind of like throwing it in my face like haha ha, look at where you ended up and that was the most unprofessional rude experience I have ever had with a doctor and I was so grateful that then I had an amazing nurse that was at least at that hospital because immediately after she left she had left at that point and I never saw her again and the nurse who was in the room at the time came up to me and she said I just want to let you know what that doctor said is absolutely not true this happens all the time. You being at home had nothing to do with what went wrong. This happens at the hospital and we see it all the time. I was so grateful for that. Like I already knew that what that doctor was saying wasn't true, but it was just really nice to kind of have someone at the hospital still kind of be on my side and not viewed as like a failed home birth. Because frankly, there was nothing about this birth that was failed at all. I had a perfect labor 
perfect delivery, no complications whatsoever. And then whenever there was a complication after delivery, I had very professional, knowledgeable midwives to know when their expertise stopped and where medical intervention was necessary. And it wasn't only the doctor either. When they put me into the ambulance to have me transferred, it was, again, the most unprofessional environment I have ever been in in my life. They didn't take anything that the midwives said seriously, and they were literally laughing at the midwives while I was sitting there inside of the ambulance as if it was a joke pretty much. I just couldn't help but think like this is why I chose a home birth. This is why I put my trust into these three amazing knowledgeable professional women and not some doctor who sees you as a a paycheck and I just want to say like I am NOT against hospital births like I had two of them and I I think hospitals are one of the best inventions in history for reasons like this for reasons when you need to be seen medically now, I just think it's sad that when I arrived there there's people who viewed me in a certain way like viewed me differently I just think that women should be able to choose what kind of birth that they want they should be able to choose if they want natural birth they should be able to choose if they want an epidural and they should be able to choose if they want to go in and just be knocked out and have a c-section there's nothing wrong with any of those ways to have a baby and the fact that I was viewed so negatively when I arrived at this hospital was just so so eye-opening and it was just it really caught me off guard like I, I have never seen people that call themselves professionals act so unprofessional in my entire life and there's like other little stories that were in between but I'm not just gonna sit here and like ramble on about my bad experience with them because that's not what this is about this is about the amazing birth that I had and the amazing people involved in throughout my whole entire birth experience so moving on though after that point post birth I was at the hospital obviously the placenta had successfully been retrieved I chose to get antibiotics for obvious reasons because of how many like different arms were inside of me. I was able to leave the hospital that day. Thank God. I just had to stay for my last round of antibiotics, which was, I think it was like 11 p.m. or something. And I asked to leave immediately after. I didn't want to stay another night because since Adeline was not born at that hospital, she was not allowed to stay with me past visiting hours, which again, I think is just crazy. Telling a mother that their new baby cannot stay with them, even for just two hours until I finished my antibiotics. So this whole labor and delivery was by far the craziest one that I've ever experienced. And I've had some pretty freaking crazy, I think, labor and deliveries. I feel like I've kind of done it all at this point, except a C-section, I guess. I hope that clears it up for you guys. I know I had so many questions about like how I felt about everything and what exactly went on. And even though I'm not able to cover every single detail, and I'm sure I'm leaving stuff out. I'm going to be like, dang it, Jessica, I wish I would have said that. Um, I hope that kind of clears it up a little bit more for exactly how everything went down. If anybody has any questions, I will definitely try to answer them in the comments below. So that is it for my labor and delivery story, guys. Sorry, that was, this is probably such a long video. I feel like I've been talking for hours. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will talk to you guys on Friday for our next video. Bye. And I am actually going right now to go take pictures of Lilia and all of her dad's side of the family. Aww. <laughs> You're such a good mom. Aww.